Stress is something that we should all figure out. Stress and anxiety and fears is all something that we should figure out before we get pregnant. Because if you think that you're stressed and anxious and fearful now, wait until you get pregnant. Wait until it actually happens after all these years. And then wait until that baby arrives. This is Tasha Blasey, integrative fertility coach, patient advocate, and mom to two very expensive children. This is the FU Project. Fertilitites unite. I want to take the time to go over and explain a lot of the myths around IVF. Whenever I'm talking to somebody whether it's somebody who's, who wants to work with us or just somebody on the street that finds out what I do, oh my gosh, the shit that comes out of their mouth. I, I either want to like hug them and be like, whoa, this is so far from the truth. Or I want to go, um, what? Where? What? Like, what? <laughs> so that's typically... Either hug or just say what over and over again. That's typically how I like to respond to some of these myths. I do that internally, of course. And then I very kindly, very calmly, I'll I'll explain it if I feel like this is something they need to know, meaning they're in their IVF journey. Otherwise, I just nod and smile if it's one of those know-it-alls who um, are not going to benefit from my advice anyway. So, Why bother, right? (laughs) Okay. The first myth is IVF works the first or second time. This is typically for people who have not, not done IVF before, but the amount of people that don't feel like they need any kind of guidance around their fertility journey because, of course, it's going to work is completely understandable because that was me. I was 33, quite cocky, doing IVF. It was my husband's fault. You know, it, his low sperm count, uh, duh. I was going to not only, you know, of course IVF was going to work, but I even had in my head, I was going to do IVF once, have a whole farm full of frozen embryos that I could just pop in every time I wanted a baby so I could, you know, get about four by the time I was 40 And of course, cut to first round of IVF. I only have two embryos. They put both in. Neither one looked that great. And it was a fail. Um, It was was an early miscarriage. Round So I had to start another egg retrieval all over again. And I was like, what? I have to do another egg retrieval? Like, could not believe that I had to do one more egg retrieval. (laughs) And then I did another egg retrieval, got another two embryos, Pop those in, and my son was born. But again, then I had no other embryos left. So my point of telling you this is I also believed that, of course, IVF was going to work for me. I, it's science. It's crazy expensive. You're putting the embryo in my uterus. Like, how what, How could that possibly not work? Well, the reality is, is that there are so many variables that go into a successful round of IVF. Variables including everything from the egg, the sperm, how the embryo is made, the body, um, and, and then everything with what the doctor decides, the drug protocol, and, and then don't forget, there's the whole lab. You know, I, I look at, there are tons of variables in the lab. Um, not only just the embryologist, all humans. I, I mention that because we don't think of them as humans. We think of them as robots that don't make mistakes. And then, of course, the environment of the actual lab. The technology, the equipment, the environment that they grow and, you know, these, these embryos in all of those, and there's many more, but all those create variables to the success of a round of IVF. Okay. 
Along those lines, another myth is that all labs are created equally. And this is one that I hear, and and it's almost like I want to have a, 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 a little bit of a tantrum and be like, what? What are you saying? For, for all the reasons that I described, the embryologists, right, in the lab, you don't know how good those embryologists are. Nobody talks about, hardly anybody talks about, the embryologist. You don't know which you can you you might know the the director, the the lab director is this, you know, famous, amazing whatever person. But who's the embryologist working on your case? And is it the same person each time? There are so many people in that clinic, in that lab. So to think about all labs are created equally, it's it's like saying all all doctors are equal. They all have medical degrees, so they're all just as good. There are no, even if it's a specialty, they're, they're all the same. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. All right, and that's what you're saying about embryologists. They're all the same. Let me tell you, my best friend had a daughter with a birth defect. She found it out at 20 weeks in utero. There were three hospitals in the entire U.S. and one doctor at each of those hospitals that she could consider for this specialized surgery. That's what we're talking about here. Now, there are many people who do pediatric cardiology. However, when you have a specialized surgery like what she needed, there were three choices, three in the entire country. Think about that. Same thing with embryologists. They're not all created equally. And the harder your case is, the better the embryologist has to be. And then, of course, there's the other factor of, well, the lab. Right. And all those variables that I mentioned from what's the technology like? What's the equipment like? What is their protocol for how they perform certain things? Um, genetic testing, biopsies and, and things like that, ISKI and things like that. So I often have conversations with clients and we talk about the importance of that lab as creating many variables to the success of their IVF. And then there's, of course, the variable of the actual lab. There are multiple famous, and I put that in quotes, but they're very, well, I shouldn't put that in quotes. There are multiple famous, there are multiple famous clinics that do that have like 15 year old technology that you you just shouldn't go there anymore they're not getting the results that they had yet they have a great reputation because 15 years ago 10 years ago they were at the top of their game but then they just coasted it's a lot less expensive to constantly be updating upgrading all of this lab technology so a lot of times i have to share internal data about labs because it doesn't seem possible that such a famous name, such a famous clinic could actually have a lab that no longer performs. Okay, another myth that makes me a little bananas <laughs> is when people say it's a numbers game. When doctors say it's a numbers game, I think I need to breathe a couple times before I answer this. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard, that it's a numbers game. Okay, that being a numbers game is extremely beneficial to the doctor that can't figure it out, right? Oh, just try again. Oh, just try again. Oh, oh my God. You know what, doctor? That seems like such a great idea for you who's getting all this money. Oh my God, yeah, that sounds like such a good idea. You know what? I am just going to keep on trying and failing and seeing what happens. What? It's not a numbers game. This is nature and science. And there are things that get in the way and things that can help 
and things that can hurt. It's not, don't ever, if anybody says to you it's a numbers game, run, like sprint out of that clinic, hopefully with your money in hand. That just means they don't know what the fuck they're doing and they're just gonna keep on guessing with your money and your time and your embryos. No, do not allow that. So to answer that myth, it's not a numbers game. There are multiple things that can get in the way of your success and multiple variables that are very well known. Okay, I'm calm. I'm calm after that one. (laughs) I'm very passionate about helping you not listen to these crazy myths. Along those lines, another myth that I hear a lot is there's nothing you can do on your end to help an egg retrieval or transfer. I, I ask whenever people are wanting to work with me, you know, I, I have almost like a, a strategy session with them because I need to, uh, to fully understand what their goals are, what their issues are, and if it's going to be a good fit. And I often say, well, what is the doctor saying that you can do to improve your egg retrieval next time? And 95% of the time, it's nothing. Sometimes they're like, you know, take this supplement. Don't eat gluten. I don't know. Like, sometimes it's like a diet thing or a supplement thing. But for the most part, nothing. I often get nothing. There are many things, many key things that you can do to help an egg retrieval or a transfer. Of course, what that would be depends on what the issue is. So, and there are always a ton of issues. Um, Are you making too many eggs and they're not mature enough to fertilize? Are you not hardly making any eggs and then they all expire um, or, or none of them turn into embryos or they turn into embryos and Um, none of them are normal. Are you implanting for a short time but not carrying the pregnancy to term? Are you miscarrying after eight weeks? All these are, there's just so many variables. And and that, of course, would, the recommendation of what you can do to help would be based on whatever is happening. But in general, this is nature. This This is nature and science at play. And the amount of things that you can do to most naturally help your body make healthy eggs and implant embryos is in the dozens. Not that everybody has to do everything. And again, there's just the key things that everybody has to do. But yes, there are things that you can do to help your IVF results. Okay, and this is kind of the last myth along the lines of what the doctors might be telling you. And then I'm going to move on to some other things. But the amount of women that I talk to that are telling me that they need egg donors is astonishing when I look at their case. And for me, it's clear that there are multiple variables into play of what could be causing the embryos to expire before day five or never get to genetic testing or get to genetic testing and never be normal. And just because a doctor can't figure it out and no longer wants to work on your own eggs, because don't forget, the more embryos that they put in and fail to get you pregnant, the lower their stats go right? The the internal online data, it it reduces. Unfortunately, this is a business, don't forget. But instead of saying, hey, I can't get it done with your own eggs, the typical answer is, let's just start all over again with donor eggs. It is true. If you're using 20-something-year-old donor eggs, you're going to have a much higher success rate. But if you don't If it's not an absolute that you need donor eggs, I wish that the doctors would be a little bit more forthcoming about, hey, I can't get this done. 
However, XYZ doctor with XYZ lab could. You have to understand if you do continue with them using donor eggs, one, much higher success rate, and two, they get to start all over with a new revenue source. And again, I hate to make this about business. I work with some of the most amazing doctors and clinics around the world that truly want nothing more than to get you pregnant. But for the most part, you have to remember that this is a business with investors, with bottom lines, okay? With with people checking to make sure they are bringing in money and stats. So if you're not helping with their stats, they're going to continue to work with you as long as they can gain more revenue. Another myth that I often have to challenge is when women talk to me and they ask me if it's their stress causing them to not get pregnant. Most of my clients are high achievers, independent, do-it-yourselfers. They like to plan, they like to do, they like to get it done their way. I attract what I am, right? So a prolonged fertility journey where you are doing everything you possibly know to do and it's not happening causes a lot of stress. And typically these women are already in fairly stressful careers. When somebody asks me if it's their stress causing them to not get pregnant, I say most likely not. Now, could I go into the science behind stress and how it creates acidity in the body and and all that stuff? Yeah, but please, we all know crazy bitches that are pregnant, like the craziest. So why would it be that our stress with our career would cause us to not get pregnant, but these insane women can get pregnant? No, I I I don't follow that. What I do know, though, What I do know is that stress doesn't help us and it doesn't feel good. So we are going to get rid of it. Stress is something that we should all figure out. Stress and anxiety and fears is all something that we should figure out before we get pregnant. Because if you think that you're stressed and anxious and fearful now, wait until you get pregnant. Wait until it actually happens after all these years. And then wait until that baby arrives. Talk about the stakes being higher, the fears being compounded. So if you have a lot of stress and anxiety before you even meet your baby, you have to fix that today. It is not going to get easier. So while you have the time before the baby arrives, I would highly recommend that you declutter. This is what we do. (laughs) This is what I call it in the program. It's it's called environment, and it's a decluttering process. Declutter your mind and body. Figure out how clutter is showing up physically, emotionally, and declutter it. Not to help you get pregnant as much as to help you through this process, through the pregnancy, and especially through motherhood with your sanity intact. This next myth, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm hesitant to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up because, of course, any fertility advice that I give has to be extremely customized. But I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a general reason why this is a myth. Okay, the myth is that you should never do a day three transfer, and especially a fresh day three transfer. Again, please take this advice, understanding that I do not know your specific case, but I can give you a general rule. When women are not making it to day five, blasts. In general, we all want day five genetically healthy embryos. But some of us can't get there. And and the reason why you can't get there 
could mean could could be because of many variables. So don't just think that if you can't get to a day five blast or the embryo to a day five blast, or you can't get the embryo, um, or or you get to a day five blast, but and you get them genetically tested, but none of them are normal. Don't think that's your absolute, and that you're always going to create genetically abnormal embryos, or you're never going to create day fives. But take that seriously, and assuming all the other variables have been taken out of the equation that could get in the way of a healthy day five blast, and assuming this is your absolute, consider not growing them to day five and consider putting them in at day three. Whether it's fresh or frozen would, of course, depend on the drug protocol that was used to, to create those eggs or, or to, you know, for the egg retrieval. Um, it would all, you know, what your hormone levels look like, what your lining looks like, history of implantation. Do they er- Have they already taken out every variable that would get in the way of implantation? Things like that help me determine if someone should do a fresh or frozen. For the most part, I like the frozens because all the variables that could get in the way of an implantation have typically not been discovered. It's very rare that they already have. So I typically do like a frozen so we can do all that work before they put in an embryo. So I would recommend, and again, I have to say this again, not knowing (laughs) your case, If you're not making it to day five blasts or you make it to day five and they're not genetically abnormal, then you might want to consider stopping at day three and and putting in a day three embryo. Okay, another myth that I often hear is there is no evidence that you need to check for a certain test. When I was talking about... When I was talking about all the variables that could get in the way of a successful transfer, I was talking about the certain tests, the certain things that I like to know have been discovered before you put in an, before you put in an embryo transfer. As you've witnessed, if you've already done IVF, the first transfer is very much trial and error, right? Let's just give you... I don't know, typically it's like a birth control or estrogen. And then once we put in the embryo, it's progesterone, typical protocol. They haven't necessarily discovered everything before putting in that embryo. So I give my clients a list of questions to ask the doctor. Should you consider X, Y, Z? And there's a list of about 10 things, certain drug protocols, certain diagnostic tests to get done, things like that. And when the doctor comes back and says, oh, there's no evidence that we need to check for that right now. My question back, which you can use on your doctors is, one, if this was my third failed transfer, would you recommend that I get these things done or do this certain protocol? Or, Even you could just ask, please tell me what your protocol is and what tests that I would get if you just completed my third failed transfer. And you ask the same question with, and please tell me the protocol you'd give me and the um, tests that you'd want me to get done if this was my third chemical or miscarriage. And whatever answer they give you, I challenge you to ask them for that protocol. Now, they may say, oh, you're going down a rabbit hole. You're going to hear the word rabbit hole. I don't know. They've all used this term and learned this term. But you're going down this rabbit hole trying to figure things out. And, and I get that. But And I don't want you to be doing a bunch of extra you know, tests, especially for my clients in, in the UK where you're paying for all these out of pocket. But I also know what it took to get that embryo. And I, I want the doctors and the clinics to start treating those embryos as precious as they really are. We're not just fucking our husbands to try to get pregnant. Okay? We're fucking our husbands for fun. Just kidding. <laughs> but 
the amount of time and energy and appointments and money. God damn the money that it took to get those embryos. And they're just doing trial and error. And once you've had three miscarriages or once you've had three failed rounds, oh, then they want to check for some things. Like, are you kidding me? No, I would rather understand the risks. I would, I would rather go down this rabbit hole, as they're going to call it, and have every variable taken out of the way before moving forward with that extremely precious embryo. Now, if you're one of those annoying people that make, (laughs) I say annoying with a ton of love and admiration, but if you're one of those annoying people that make like 10 genetically healthy embryos, okay? I I don't work with any of those people. Well, I did, I've worked with a couple of them. That's very rare though. Uh, I would say like 2% of my clients. But if you're one of those people, great, have at it. You're not going to have 10 children, most likely. So yeah, you could do a trial and error. But especially for those that hardly get to make an embryo because you have low egg reserve or, um, or you just have one left, do everything possible uh, to, to ensure that that embryo is going to implant. And when they say there's no evidence, you now know the two questions to ask. And the last myth to dispel is... Maybe you just weren't meant to be a mom. Oof, ouch. That hurts even saying that. The fact is, being a mom is an identity. And you get to choose your identity. So when you are thinking that this isn't working because you weren't supposed, because maybe, so, so when you're in the lows of your fertility journey, And you say to yourself, maybe I just wasn't meant to be a mom. I want you to remember that you do get to choose if you're a mom or not. You don't get to choose when you become a mom because it's not just up to you. There's that little booger who also has a choice of when and how he or she shows up. And honestly, that's one of the best lessons in parenthood is Please do not try to control <laughs> how and when you're, and what your child decide, you know, shows up as because you will, you will be, uh, that, that will be a hilarious joke every time. So the earlier you can say, hey, hey, my child, I accept you however you decide to show up and I accept you whenever you decide to show up. That being said, get your ass over here, all right? Mama's been waiting a long time, but I understand it's not just up to mama. So for those reasons and more, I accept how and when you show up. I am a mom. You are a mother. That is a choice you get to make. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise, especially that a-hole living in your head. But we got to get you there sooner than later. Right? And that's what I'm going to help you do. But please know, you were meant to be a mom. You will be a mom. Let's get some of these variables out of the way that's preventing you from being a mom. But don't ever let anybody tell you about who you get to be and who you were meant to be. And that was my baby making lesson of the day. For more of my fertility advice and adventures, please visit TashaBlasi.com. Sending you thanks and love always.